Welcome once again to our weekly teachings. But before we start, I want to read a scripture verse from the book of Isaiah, chapter 40, verses 31. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. The word of the Lord is already blessed. And before the teachings, I pray that as I've read the word of God, that the Holy Spirit ministers to you. But most of all, the teaching tonight, we're going to be telling you the most important part of our Christian walk. That is um, remembering Palm Sunday before Jesus entered the city of Jerusalem. And it's a price that he paid for all of us all our sins so we thank you once again for joining us and may you be receptive what the spirit of god is saying be blessed the chapter chapter 21 of matthew starts the account of what is known as passion week in the gospel of matthew and in that chapter we see three signs the entry on the donkey the symbolic cleansing of the temple and the cursing of the fig tree which present jesus as a prophetic sage like but greater than Solomon, as Jesus announces the end of the corrupt temple and the beginning of the eschatological age. So, so let us uh, look at um, Matthew chapter 21 verses 1 to 22 as uh, we begin uh, this uh, study tonight of Palm Sunday. And we start reading in verse 1. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there, and with a colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, say that the Lord had needs them, and he will send them right away. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to daughter Zion, see your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey, and a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord! Hosanna in the highest heaven! When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? The crowds answered, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. Jesus entered the temple courts and drove out all who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves. It is written, he said to them, My house will be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a den of robbers. The blind and the lame came to him at the temple and he healed them. But when the chief priests and the teachers of the law saw the wonderful things he did, and the children shouting in the temple courts, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant. Do you hear what these children are saying, they asked him? Yes, replied Jesus. Have you never heard from the lips of children and infants, you, Lord, have called forth your praise? And he left them and went out of the city to Bethany, where he spent the night. Early in the morning, as Jesus was on his way back to the city, he was hungry. Seeing a fig tree by the road, he went up to it, but found nothing on it except leaves. Then he said to it, May you never bear fruit again. Immediately the tree withered. When the disciples saw this, they were amazed. How did the fig tree wither so quickly, they asked. Jesus replied, Truly I tell you, if you have faith and do not doubt, not only can you do what you have done to the fig tree, but also you can say to this mountain, go, throw yourself into the sea, and it will be done. If you believe, you will receive whatever you ask for in prayer. The triumphal entry is recorded in all four Gospels. The context of the passage is that prior to his arrival in Jerusalem, in Matthew chapter 21, Jesus had already predicted he was going to Jerusalem to die, in Matthew 20, verses 17 to 19. Now Jesus was going up to Jerusalem. 
On the way, he took the twelve aside and said to them, We are going up to Jerusalem, and a son of man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death, and will hand him over to the Gentiles to be mocked and flogged and crucified. On the third day, he will rise to life. And Jesus also predicted his death in Matthew 16, 21 and Matthew 17, 22 to 23. And also in Thomas, uh, and Thomas in John eleven sixteen before the triumphal entry, when Jesus told the disciples he was returning to Judea. Mm. And of course, Jerusalem was in Judea. However, in the Gospel of John, before entering Jerusalem, Jesus raises Lazarus from the, je from the dead in John 11 and is then anointed by Mary in John 12, 7 through 8. Leave her alone, Jesus replied. It was intended that she should save this perfume for the day of my burial. You will always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. In Matthew, Jesus restores the sight of two blind men. In Mark chapter 10, one blind man, and Luke, the blind man, is healed at Jericho, and Zacchaeus is restored before Jesus goes on towards Jerusalem. Although known as Passion Week, the Gospels are not definitive as to whether all the events between the entry to Jerusalem and the resurrection are actually a week or longer. In compiling the Gospels, the authors have sometimes adopted a topical rather than a chronological presentation of the material. The first point to note is that Bethphage in Aramaic means the house of unripe figs, which plays into verses 18 and 22, which we read, we'll see later. The exact location of Bethphage is unknown, but it was near Jerusalem. And it's not certain whether the provision of the donkey was prearranged or Jesus just directed the disciples to get the donkey, arguing against a prearrangement with the instructions on what to say if the owner objected. There was a tradition in early Judaism that great teachers or royal figures could requisition an animal when the need arose. If an animal was not or only recently broken in, then the mother would accompany the foal. So Matthew talks of two donkeys and Mark of one. The coats were put on both animals, but Jesus sat on one. And the scripture that's referred to in uh, Matthew 21 is from Zechariah 9, 9 through 10. It says, Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion, shout, daughter Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. I will take away the chariots from Ephraim and the war horses from Jerusalem, and the battle bow will be broken. He will proclaim peace to the nations. His rule will extend from sea to sea and from, river, from the river to the ends of the earth. But riding on a donkey as king is reminiscent of King Solomon, which we see in 1 Kings chapter 1, verses 32 to 40. King David said, Call in Zadok the priest, Nathan the prophet, and Beniah, son of Jehoiada. When they came before the king, he said to them, Take your Lord's servants with you, and have Solomon my son mount my own mule, and take him down to Gihon. There have Zadok the priest, and Nathan the prophet, anoint him king over Israel. Blow the trumpet and shout, Long live King Solomon. Then you are to go up with him, and he is to come and sit on my throne and reign in my place. I have appointed him ruler over Israel and Judah. Benaiah, son of Jehoiada, answered the king, Amen. May the Lord, the God of my lord, the king, so declare it. As the Lord was with my lord, the king, so may he be with Solomon, to make his throne even greater than the throne of my lord, King David. So Zadok the priest, Nathan the prophet, Benaiah, son of Jehoiada, the Karaites and the Pelophites went down and had Solomon mount King David's mule, and they escorted him to Gihon. Zadok the priest took the horn of oil from the sacred tent and anointed Solomon. Then they sounded the trumpet, and all the people shouted, Long live King Solomon! And all the people went up after him, playing pipes and rejoicing greatly, so that the ground shook with the sound. Unlike King David, King Solomon was known as a king of peace and wisdom. It was also a time of danger for Solomon, as Adonijah was trying to take the throne on David's death. Matthew 21.9 refers to Hosanna to the son of David, whereas Mark in chapter uh, 11 reads in verse 10, Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Jesus is making a statement by his entry into Jerusalem. His time had come and he was setting into motion the events that would end at Calvary and Easter Sunday. His entry is a reminder of Solomon, but one greater, as he had already alluded to in Matthew 12.38. Jesus says that something greater than Solomon is here. 
Then some of the Pharisees and teachers of the law said to him, Teacher, we want to see a sign from you. He answered, A wicked and adulterous generation asks for a sign, but none will be given except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of a huge fish, so the Son of Man will be there three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh will stand up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it. For they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and now something greater than Jonah is here. The Queen of the South will rise at the judgment with this generation and condemn it. For she came from the ends of the earth to listen to Solomon's wisdom, and now something greater than Solomon is here. The entry into the Jerusalem is the only time in the Gospels that we read of Jesus riding and being above the disciples. The choice of donkey was significant and there was not a horse associated with war, but a donkey associated with royal coronations and kings on parade. It reflected Jesus denying the role of the conquering Messiah, but taking on the Prince of Peace. Jesus was coming to meet the need for a universal saviour, not to be a political solution to overthrow the Romans. The crowds respond to Jesus by spreading their garments in the way and cutting down branches and spreading them on the road. John tells us that a crowd went out from the city to meet him. Spreading the cloaks on the ground was a way to honour the kings in Israel, as you see in 2 Kings 9 and 13 with the coronation of Yehu. As was cutting down branches and palm branches were reminiscent of the Maccabees and their triumphal entry into Jerusalem. 1 Maccabees 13.51 says, On the 23rd day of the second month in the year 171, there was a great celebration in the city because this terrible threat to the security of Israel had come to an end. Simon and his men entered the fort singing hymns of praise and thanksgiving while carrying palm branches and playing harps, cymbals and lyres. When the Maccabees overthrew their Seleucid overlords in the mid-160s BC and ritually cleansed the temple. Any association between Jesus and his followers and the Maccabeans would seem threatening to the Romans and their vassals. In this case, the high priest who served at the pleasure of Rome. These crowds that we read about are going up to Passover, so they would have been celebrating and singing of Psalms. Psalms 118, 26 through 27 says, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. From the house of the Lord we bless you. The Lord is God and he's made his light shine on us. With bows in hand, join in the festal procession up to the horns of the altar. It's not clear from Matthew or any of the Gospels how many of the crowd had actually come with Jesus from Nazareth. But when the city, the people in Jerusalem ask, who is this? The crowd answer, this is Jesus, the prophet of Nazareth of Galilee. But this is not the complete and correct answer, for Jesus is much more than a prophet. But it's enough to cause consternation for the leaders in Jerusalem, especially if it also is meant to refer to the prophet Moses had promised would come in Deuteronomy 18. At Passover, the population of Jerusalem could swell to more than 10 times their normal size, and with the pressure on the Jewish leaders not to antagonize the Roman authorities who allowed them to be in power, they would not want any incidents that might endanger that relationship. And coming right after the entry into Jerusalem is another reference to the Maccabees cleansing the temple, an overtly military act, which may explain why Jesus stops and leaves the temple. He is not there to be a warrior messiah. It's believed that a lot of the trading that was taking place inside the temple had only recently been brought inside it, having previously been taken uh, place outside the temple, and that the high priest received part of the money from the trading. But once cleansed, the scripture says that Jesus healed the blind and the lame. Well, the blind and lame were prohibited from entering the, te- the inner temple, and so were restricted to the outer courts. Having symbolically cleared the temple, Je- Jesus heals the blind and lame, so they can now enter the temple and worship God directly. So Jesus is restoring worship in his actions. And incidentally, this is the only recorded healings Jesus performs in Jerusalem. The disciples did not see Jesus' actions as condemning the temple, rather than the practices and leaders in the temple. Unlike the Qumran community that withdrew from the temple altogether, the disciples still frequented the temple as we read in the book of Acts. The cleansing of the temple was a symbolic gesture as it did not stop the merchants returning. Jesus' anger was at the corrupt practices inside the temple that he foresaw the destruction of the temple within a generation. And he wanted to preach the gospel in the court of the Gentiles to strangers and foreigners. 
a sign of the expanding gospel to all nations. But he was unable as the merchants were there. This action is the catalyst of the leaders determining to eliminate Jesus. Luke and Mark are much more explicit than Matthew in telling their reaction. Mark 11:18 says, The chief priests and teachers of the law heard this and began looking for a way to kill him, for they feared him, because the whole crowd was amazed at his teaching. After Jesus leaves the temple and he returns in the next morning, he curses the fig tree. And the cursing of the fig tree depicts the coming judgment on unfruitful Israel. This is the only example of Jesus using his power to curse or harm. Fig trees had two crops. The first in the year in April were bitter. The second in the fall uh, were sweet. And this is reminiscent of Micah 7, 1 through 2. What misery is mine? I am like one who gathers summer fruit at the gleaning of the vineyard. There is no cluster of grapes to eat, none of the early figs that I crave. The faithful have been swept from the land. Not one upright person remains. Everyone lies in wait to shed blood. They hunt each other with nets. The fig tree is an image of the morally and spiritually barren leaders of Israel. Jesus curses the tree as a picture of the coming judgment of Israel. As we see in Jeremiah 8, where it says, Say to them, this is what the Lord says. When people fall down, do they not get up? When people turn away, do they not return? Why then have these people turned away? Why does Jerusalem always turn away? They cling to deceit. They refuse to return. I have listened attentively, but they do not say what is right. None of them repent of their wickedness, saying, What have I done? Each pursues their own course like a horse charging into battle. Even the stalk in the sky knows our appointed season, and the dove, the swift and the thrush observe the time of their migration. But my people do not know the requirements of the Lord. How can you say we are wise for we have the law of the Lord, when actually the lying pen of the scribes has handled it falsely? The wise will be put to shame. They will be dismayed and trapped. Since they have rejected the word of the Lord, what kind of wisdom do they have? Therefore, I will give their wives to other men and their fields to new owners. For the least to the greatest, all are greedy for gain. Prophets and priests alike, all practice deceit. They dress the wound of my people as though it was not, not serious. Peace, peace, they say. When there is no peace, are they ashamed of their detestable conduct? No, they have no shame at all. They do not even know how to blush. So they will fall among the fallen. They will be brought down when they are punished, says the Lord. I will take away their harvest, declares the Lord. There will be no grapes on the wine. There will be no figs on the tree, and their leaves will wither. What I have given them will be taken from them. As the fig tree represents Israel, it's also possible that the reference to this mountain in Jerusalem would be the Temple Mount. And Jesus is predicting the fall of the temple and Jesus rebuilding a new temple. That the believer's faith is not in the temple, but in God. We remember John four nineteen to 24 with the woman at the pole. So the woman said, I can see that you're a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Woman, Jesus replied, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father, neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshippers will worship the Father in the spirit and in truth, for they are the kind of worshippers the Father seek. God is spirit, and his worshippers must worship in the spirit and in truth. Or it could be a reference to the Mount of Olives in Zechariah 14.4 in Jesus' return. On that day his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives east of Jerusalem, and the Mount of Olives will be split in two from east to west, forming a great valley, with half of the mountain moving north and half moving south. So what are the lessons of Palm Sunday for us today? There are three. The first... Know who Jesus is. 
is not just a prophet or a good man, but the second person of the Trinity. John 1, 1 through 5 tells us, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made, and without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Acts 4.12 tells us, Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. So we must know who Jesus is to be our saviour. There's salvation in nobody else. We must make that decision to accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Saviour of our lives. The second thing to learn, don't let our relationship with God or your relationship with God suffer as a result of habit or compromise or the flesh. We don't want to be judged like the fig tree. Yet scripture tells us we will be judged. In 2 Corinthians 5, 6 through 10, the Apostle Paul writes, Therefore we are always confident and know that as long as we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. For we live by faith, not by sight. We are confident, I say, and would prefer to be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So we make it our goal to please him, whether we are at home in the body or away from it. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each of us may receive what is due, due us for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. We all look forward to hearing, well done, thy good and faithful servant. But what are we doing while we're here on this earth to warrant hearing that from our Lord? And thirdly, our worship of God is not centred on a building. But rather if we read in 1 Corinthians 3.16, don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple? and that God's Spirit dwells in your midst. Indeed, the time has now come, and the true worshippers worship the Father in spirit and in truth. We can still and must still worship God our Father. So as we celebrate Palm Sunday, let us take these lessons to heart, that it's not just about something that we read about in the past, but as with all God's Word, it's a living word for us today.